but I believe it's topical and I believe it's on the, it's on the, kind of on the nose as far as what we're going through right now. What day is it? June 2nd. June, if you didn't know, is International Pride Month. And uh, I don't know why they decided to make a month out of pride. Pride Month is a wicked time of the year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we just can't escape it. The world is filled with pride. And I, I want to just show you, I want to bring your attention to the book of Job, chapter 41. Now, verse 34. Now, this is speaking of the devil, and it says here in verse 34, He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Okay? Now, what you just read is a description of Leviathan. Now, that is Satan. Forget what any Bible expositor has to say, that it's just some sort of animal. No, that's the devil. Now, having told you that i want to ask you what i want to ask you what is this you've never seen a sermon like this this is a crown have it your way ain't that just the most proud thing you can have having it your way well the devil the bible says is a king over the children of pride So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be preaching to you on pride, pride. Now, if the devil is the king of pride, it would go without saying that there must be a kingdom of pride. If the devil is a king of pride and he has a kingdom of pride, there must be a people of pride. If there is a people of pride in the kingdom of pride, there must be the laws of pride. If there is a kingdom of pride with a people and a king and the laws, there must be a land of pride. Today I'm going to be preaching to you on such things. Now the first point I would like to bring to your attention is over the king of pride, of the children of pride. Now number one, the devil is the leader over this kingdom. He is the king of all that is evil he is that wicked serpent you saw, you read about in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that he is the prince of the power of the air. And it goes on further to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that he is the God of this world. Now his kingship is based on lies, deceit, bondage, and perversion. That is the king of pride. This leader has been one of the three major tempters in this world that we've had to go up against. The Bible calls him a roaring lion. The Bible calls him an accuser of the brethren. He is the king of all that is evil. He is the king of pride. Many of you have had experiences with this king. Maybe you've, many of you have been under the reign of this king. Many of you have gone, had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this king. But let me tell you something. You can't go up against him. The Bible says that even the archangel durst not bring a railing accusation against him. If you think that you're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the king of pride, the king of the children of pride, you're sorely mistaken. If you think that you're going to outbox the devil, you're going to outfight the devil, you're going to have victory over the devil in your flesh, you're sorely mistaken. You can't have it. All right, you got to understand that this is the second most powerful being in the universe. If the archangel Michael can't even put a uh, railing accusation against him, what makes you think you're going to do any better? Understand that an angel in the Bible, not just an archangel, just any angel in the Bible, you know how powerful one of them is? Can slay over 100,000 men in a single night like it's nothing. Easy. All right? These beings are supernaturally powerful. These beings, the Bible says they, they're the sons of God. They came down and they breeded with women. And they gave supermen. All right? They gave, they gave these giants and mighty men of men of renown, the men of old. What makes you think you can do any better than an angel? Now, believe it or not, this king is not an angel. The Bible says he is transformed as an angel of light. You hear that? You hear me? Deceit. He transforms himself into an angel. He isn't an angel. The Bible calls him the covering cherub. Now, this devil, he flew overhead of God, and he was like the celestial disco ball. 
And he, what he would do is he would reflect the light, the light of God. And the Bible says he had tabrets and pipes and he could give music. He was a music. He was the song leader in heaven. Now, I don't know about you. If that was me, I'd start to get a pretty big head, wouldn't you? If God allowed me to fly over ahead of him and have to and shine his light, his beauty, I think pretty soon I'd start to think that's my light and that's my beauty. Obviously, you know, that's not true. But needless to say, the devil is uh, was proud. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14, he said the statement, I will five times. I will ascend above uh, the heights of the cloud, mount to the congregation. I will exalt my throne. The devil said I five times. Pride has to do with I. I. Uh, the best definition that I've ever had on the word pride, you wouldn't believe me, but I think this is the best definition definition of pride is a sinful is an over occupation with self it's a focus on self me 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 so that king of pride i will i will i will i will i will that's where it all comes from now this king cannot be the king. This leader cannot be a leader without his legions. Without his legions. Now we read right there that he is king over all the children of pride. Now my question to you today is who are those children? Who are the children of the devil? Not me, pastor. <laughs> okay, well maybe you're saved. Maybe you are. But I'll tell you this. Satan has children. The Bible calls them the children of disobedience. The Bible calls them the children of Belial. It calls them the children of wickedness, 2 Samuel 7.10. calls them the children of the devil, 1 John 3.10. And the Bible says they are the children of wrath, Ephesians 2.3. Needless to say, and I keep saying that, but needless to say, the world is filled with the children of Satan. Well, where are they? I don't see any horns on you guys. I don't see any, uh, any, any uh, uh, pitchforks or a, 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 a thorned tail. The thing is, go to Ephesians chapter 2. We're all born into this kingdom. The Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened. Now, that word quickened simply means to be made alive. You hath he quickened. Christian, Paul is talking to you. If you're a saved Christian, the Bible says God hath made you alive. Who what? Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Before you were ever born again, if you are born again, you were born a child of the devil. You had Satan's, you, you were uh, Satan's child. Sure, you didn't have the red skin, you didn't have the pitchfork, you didn't have the horns, you didn't have the tail. But let me tell you something, you were Satan's child nonetheless. All a person has to do to be Satan's child is be born, is be born the first time. Why do you think Jesus said, marvel not that I said unto you, ye must be born again. The first time you're born, you're not born into God's family. How many of you ever heard this before? Oh, well, we're just all God's children. Isn't that cute? Isn't that nice? We're just God's children. Can't we get along? No. No, we can't. We got different families. If you want to be part of my family, you have to be born again. You have to be spiritually adopted. You have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Until then, you're part of that spiritual family of the devil, the children of pride, the children of disobedience, of Belial, of wickedness, of wrath, of the devil. And the lost world right now, every lost person is under Satan's reign and authority as the devil. The only thing you have to do to become a citizen of this kingdom is be born. We're all born into it. You're born into that kingdom. But what's a kingdom without a set of rules, a set of laws to abide by? 
What is the governing authority of this kingdom? If you turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 9, I'll show you the governing authority, the laws, the bylaws by which this kingdom is ruled by. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 27. I'll give you a second to turn there as soon as... uh, Chapter 9, verse 27. Now it says here in verse 27, chapter 9 of Nehemiah, Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them, and in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. Now pause here real quick. This is talking about the Jews and how they would they would do little good for a little while, and then after that they'd backslide. And they would do pretty good under God for a little while, and then after that they'd backslide again. And after a while it got kind of old. God said, you know, you keep getting right, and you keep calling on me, and I keep saving you, and I keep delivering you, and you keep going back to your old ways, and you keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You can only do that so much before God says, finally, all right, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm done delivering you. And that's a dangerous point to be. Now read here in verse 29. And testifiest against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. Now... Notice how it said there, yet they dwelt proudly and hearken not unto thy commandments. The law of pride, the law of pride is do anything you want except what God told you to do. The law of pride says every, anything's fine, just don't do anything God wants you to do. Don't listen to God, just do it your way. After all, isn't pride all about having it your way? There is a, not to kill the tension here, but there is a hymn, one of the greatest hymns ever made that glorifies God so much. Many of you have heard it. How many of you have heard the hymn, How Great Thou Art? And if you want to talk about a hymn that glorifies God, How Great Thou Art has to be on one of the very tops of the list. There was a preacher not too long ago, and he and he uh, he he wrote a song called "The Baptist Egotist," and you would be surprised how many Baptists are quite proud. <laughs> so he wrote a song to the sound to the tune of "How Great Thou Art," and he wrote it from the perspective of a Baptist egotist. Now, if you were a proud Baptist, what kind of hymn would you sing? Oh, Lord, my God, I'm sure folks often wonder, considering all the good works I have done, how I'm so great, and yet how I stay humble, how I'm so smart, and others are so dumb. Then sings my soul in great Humility, how great I am, how great I am. Why are you laughing? Then sings my soul with great humility. Does everyone know how great I am? And then at the end of the song, he says, what's that, Lord? I'm not so great. And he starts crying. But you know what? People sing that in their heart all the time. You know, when they put a little bit more money in the plate, hoping someone sees it. When uh, they puff their chest and shout their standards, while others of lesser standard are in earshot. We have such proud people in churches today. And before you think, well, that couldn't be me. Odds are it is. 
See, pride is not something that is just uh, for a select group of people. I don't have the same problem with pride as others do, Lord. I'm humble. People say that. Do you remember the Pharisee and the publican? Where the Pharisee on one side is praying to the Lord and saying, God, I thank you that I'm not as other, other men, such as that publican over there, a sinner. And the publican, on the, other, uh, the publican on the other side is saying, God, forgive me. And he smote his breast, asking God to forgive him. And which one did, you, did Jesus say was justified in that day? The publican, the, publican, the sinner. So if a kingdom has a king, its leader, and it has a legion, and it has the law, I think it stands without reasoning, there must be a land. Now where would the land of the kingdom of pride reside? First, I want to, show, I want to tell you that number one, the land of the kingdom of pride is a very vast land. Remember the Bible said that he is the prince of the power of the air. In the book of Job, it says how he goeth up and down through the earth. It says that in the second Corinthians chapter four, that he is the God of this world. You don't have to go very far to find this land of the kingdom of pride. You see it in the White House all the way down to the whorehouse. You see it. Uh, you see it in the Senate to the slums. You see it on the billboards to the message boards. You see pride everywhere. You can see it at City Hall right now. It's not just the rainbow flag, all right? People can wave the American flag with just as much pride as the, as the rainbow flag. It's all over. That kingdom is seemingly endless. You can't go anywhere without seeing it. But I'll tell you this right now. It's not just out there in the world. The most important place you must understand where this kingdom resides is within the hearts of men. Uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Now to any person that says, I thank the Lord, I don't have this pride problem that others have. I'll show you right now, you have it. And it's inside of you. It's inside the hearts of every individual in this room right now. The book of Mark chapter 7 verse 20. It says, and he said... Jesus speaking, that which cometh out of the man, that, def uh, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For within, out of the heart of men, proceed what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. I don't know about you, I think I just counted 13 must be a coincidence. Out of the hearts of men comes pride. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to be taught pride. You just kind of have it. Every person in this room. And the more you deceive yourselves. By the way, did you know pride blinds a person? Pride blinds you. And you start to look in that mirror. And you start to think, wow, I look good. And really, you don't realize, you've never really seen what you look like. When you look in a reflection, you understand this, that that's not you. That's a mirror image. Did you know that the mirrors can be inaccurate? You can look really good in one mirror. Ladies, you know this. You can look really good in one mirror and then in another mirror. Ugh. Why? Because you never get the actual view of what you look like. It's not exactly one-to-one. -one. There can be contortions. There can be uh, the way the light reflects. It can be different. You don't really know what you look like. That's why you need a final authority, something to really tell you with how you are, what you are, what you do, and what you need to do about it. And every time you deceive yourself and say, I'm not as other men, I'm not as other men, I'm not like that sinner, I'm not like this sinner, I'm better, I'm not as bad as such and such a person, I don't have to, the same problems as this person. Well, let me tell you something, you got worse problems. Pride. You know, the number one thing God hates above all else is pride. Anything, any other sin. Pride, pride, pride. 
And yet, this whole world is filled with it. The worst offense is in the pride of the children of God. You see, the lost world, they're lost. That's just what they do. They're born the first time into the kingdom of the devil. What excuse do you have as a safe Christian to, to have this pride inside of you and be puffed up over something you didn't earn? I, I'm sorry, I, I thought it said, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. What did you do to get to where you are? You did nothing. God is the one that put you there. Well, no one else could do what I'm doing up here. You're replaceable. God can replace you like that. You think you're the best preacher in the room. You think you're the best speaker in the room. You think you're the cleanest Christian in the room. I'll tell you this right now. God has 7,000 more even better than you. All right? It's by God's grace that he's put you here. Don't ever think you're higher than you really are. You know, if you want to preach on something that will hit everyone, I found two things that get everyone more than any other subject in the Bible. Bitterness and pride. You want to hit everyone in the room, you preach on those two subjects, you'll hit it ten times out of ten. Someone here is bitter. Someone here is proud. It's a kingdom nearby, and we all have it in us. We have it when we Christians argue with each other. Proverbs 13, uh, 10. Proverbs 13.10. When you find yourself at odds with your fellow brethren, the Bible says, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. When you have contention in the church, contention in relationships, contention in the household, it's because of someone's pride. Now, either both of you are proud or just one of you is proud, but someone's proud. Only by con pride comes contention. We have contention in our churches. It's prevalent in our teachers. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Am I going too fast for y'all? This is a doctrinal teaching, so I'm sorry. I'm not proud of it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. If any man teach... Actually, I'll start in verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are, the, they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself but godliness with contentment is great gain you see how pride is connected with being ill content you, you see how pride is connected with uh, doctrinal teaching or undoctrinal teaching sometimes people they want to put themselves in a position higher than god has made them to be why because they're not content with what god gave them Remember in the wilderness, the children of Israel? What was the one thing that got them, uh, that got God to smite them? The one thing they did? Murmuring. Murmuring. I'm tired of this, God. I'm sick of this. That's the one sin that you can commit that got above all else. Not being content. Complaining. Whining. Thinking that God can't provide your needs. Thinking that you know better than God. Having that pride in you that, that, that says, I want it my way, God, not yours. Does anyone in this room think that ha they don't have that problem? I have it. You see, that's the problem is, is when you won't admit it. When you won't confess it. When you won't own up to it and say, God, I'm proud. It's all over. 
you see the rainbow flags and, and, and all the things that you see, the, the LGBT and all that nonsense, that's not the problem. That's the byproduct of what we are experiencing now is pride. Pride. Saying, I hate the Bible. I hate God's word. I think it's historically inaccurate. I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's just an old book written by men. I think it doesn't apply to our day and age. I think it's hate speech. You know what would cause a person to say that? Pride. Pride. It's in the hearts of every man. Now, every kingdom has a leader, the devil in this case. It has a legion, its people. It has the law. It has the land. But I'm going to add two more to this. It has a loss. Every kingdom must fall. Just, and this one's going to fall soon. I'll tell you right now. Every kingdom must fall. The Bible says this in Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18. I'll show you what pride is going to lead you to if you stick around. Proverbs 16, 18. The Bible says here. Pride goeth before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. That pride, that pride that you have in your heart, that you so desperately cling to, that you won't confess, that you won't give it to God and admit that you have a sin problem, that's going to be your downfall. God always has a way of just uh, giving you just enough rope to hang yourself with. All right, you won't get it right. I'll leave you to your own devices. You won't follow my law. You'd rather be unified against me just like they did in the Tower of Babel. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you exactly the opposite of what you intended. And God always has a poetic form of justice. Remember the Tower of Babel? They came together. Well, what did God do? He divided the tongues, the languages. He has a way of poetically just hanging you by your own rope. I don't want to be a part. I don't want to be hung by my own rope. That rope is your pride. What was Sodom's sin? A lot of people think, well, it was sodomy. No, that was a byproduct. Go, to me, uh, go with me to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. Verses 46 to 49. Sodom's sin. Verse 46. I'll give you a second. I want you to read this. Chapter 16, verse 46. Ezekiel. Chapter 16, verse 46. It says, And thine elder sister is Samaria, she and her daughters that dwell in thy left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if, it, as if that were a very little thing, thou was corrupted more than they in all thy ways. As I live, saith the Lord God, thy uh, Sodom, thy sister, hath not done she, she nor her daughters hast thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Number one, pride. Number two, fullness of bread. Number three, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Four, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So how many did you count? I counted five. What's the number of death in the Bible again? Oh, it must be a coincidence. Notice that all started with pride. Fullness of bread. And abundance of idleness. This is starting to sound kind of similar, don't you think? That sounds pretty close to home. Where did we go wrong? Pride isn't up here. It's in here. Can I tell you something? 
you're in trouble. If you're a lost person today, man, you're going to wish you were in Sodom and Gomorrah very soon because it'll be better for them than it is going to be for you if you don't get saved. Matthew 11, to take a spiritual application, I want to show you Matthew 11, verses 23 to 24. The Bible says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to where? To hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, if you remember the story, Sodom and Gomorrah, they, God destroyed it. And Sodom and Gomorrah was a wicked, evil place filled with all sorts of perversion and vileness. But you want to know the reason why they fell off? You want to know who had the opportunity to change that whole situation? It was a righteous man, Lot. Remember the story, Abraham, he pleaded with God, said, God, how about just 10 people? If you could find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you spare them? And God said, okay. And the angels come by and they're doing inspection. He sees Lot and he says, all right, there's your family. Is there anyone else here? Well, uh, I mean, he, he, look, look at this mansion I got. Look at this. Look what I built. Look, I sit in the gate. I'm a, I'm, I'm a leader here. Are you going to destroy this? But look, look at, here's a feast. And Lot didn't have any converts. He had no fruit. Yet the Bible called him righteous. And he lived in that wicked area and his soul was sore vexed. And yet he had nothing to show for it. He could have made the difference. Just like you can make the difference. What are you doing with what God gave you? Yeah, we're here in Sodom, spiritual Sodom, whatever you want to call it. I know that's Israel, but to take a spiritual application, what are you doing in Sodom right now? Because judgment's coming. And it'll be better for Sodom than it will be for America. So there's going to be a downfall. There's going to be a grave loss. I'm telling you, you're, you're lost family members. You're lost co-workers. You're lost friends. They have to escape. Time is so short. The Bible says in Proverbs that pride will bring a man low. Judgment's coming one day, man. It was pride that got David. It can happen to David. It can happen to you. When David numbered the children of Israel, it was pride that got Hezekiah after God had healed him. If it can happen to Hezekiah, it can happen to you. I'm not as other men, God. The Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, I don't want to end on a negative. You all know the problem now. The problem is in the hearts of men. The problem is in your hearts. You have pride in you and you need to confess it. You need to get it right. And you need to continue to keep fighting against it and continue to keep humbling yourself. It's not a one-time thing where you say, God, I'm proud and you're, that's it. You're no longer, you're done with it. No, you have to continue to put that thing down. You have to continue to walk circumspectly and look at your life and the way that you're living and the way that you're treating each other and keep looking at that accurate mirror. The one mirror that tells you everything about you down to the exact molecule. All right. It can tell you your exact chemical makeup. It can show you the exact mirror reflection of what you look like, what you really are. And I'll tell you right now, it's not pretty. That's why you got to keep looking at this mirror. And most importantly, you need to be looking for the Lord. Because every kingdom has a leader. Every kingdom has a legion. Every kingdom has a law. Every kingdom has a law, uh, a land. It has a loss. And you know what? That loss is going to come from the Lord, the conqueror. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the one that's going to topple this whole thing over. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ, no other person on the face of the earth is more qualified to overthrow this spiritual wicked kingdom of Satan than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the most humble 
humble of people. He is the most humble. I'll tell you this. He was born in a manger to a poor carpenter's family. He had no form nor comeliness that others should want him. He had, he had made himself, the Bible says, of no reputation. All right? The Bible says he made himself a servant. He subjected himself to the worst man could do to him. He sat with publicans and sinners, and he surrendered his will to the Father. I counted seven. Did you count seven? Must be a coincidence. Um, Jesus Christ is the one qualified. He is the one that God is going to give everything to. And when God gives it to Jesus Christ, guess who he's going to give it to? Jesus Christ is going to give it to us. His kingdom, the kingdom of God is superior to Satan's kingdom in every way. Whereas Satan was cruel, he was wicked, he was evil, he was an oppressor. Jesus Christ will lift us up and he will put us on higher places. He will give us liberty and freedom. He will give us that peace, that joy that we so desperately need. But in order to enter into that kingdom, you must be born again. If you're a lost person today, will you revoke your citizenship and transfer into a new kingdom? Remember when the Bible says that the kingdom was translated from Saul to David? You need to go through a similar translation from kingdom to kingdom. I'll tell you this right now. You don't have to do anything to get into it. All you got to do is just believe Jesus Christ. This is a kingdom ruled by the king of kings. This is a kingdom where the Bible says we are citizens. Turn with me to Ephesians 2.19. I'm wrapping things up here, but we're all, uh, let's just go through this last list. Ephesians 2.19, the Bible says here, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of God and of the household of God, and are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You are now citizens of this land. And we have a new law. The Bible says this. Don't turn with me, but the Bible says this in the book of Romans. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Satan's law. We have a kingdom with a new law, with new citizens, with a new king, and we have a kingdom with a new land. The Bible says in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, there is a new land, a new kingdom that you will inhabit, that you will dwell in. The Bible says this in John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe it also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and, that way, uh, and the way ye know. So you have a new law, you have a new land, and the Bible says in Isaiah that it is a world without end. This kingdom will never be toppled, it will never be overthrown, it will never stop, it will never cease, it will continue to expand and grow in righteousness and pureness and love and charity, and you'll never, ever, ever have the risk of being overthrown. Are you in this kingdom today? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You want to know why God hates pride so much? Because it's the one thing that a person clings to, to reject Jesus Christ. What do you mean? In order to be saved, you have to forsake your own personal righteousness and say to God, it's not good enough. You have to put your pride down, your ego aside and say, God, I'm a sinner in need of a real savior. That's why God hates pride so much. Because it's the thing that will keep you from him. It's the thing that will blind you. You remember, you remember Nebuchadnezzar? Remember how he was lifted up in pride? It's the one thing that a person clings to that keeps them from God. That's why God hates it so much. And if you want to become part of this kingdom, translate it into it, 
become a part of the, the family of God, you need to put your pride aside and say, God, I'm a sinner in need of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I believe I'm talking to saved Christians here, but just so you know, in case you're lost, it's as simple as ABC. A, admit to God you are a sinner. Put that pride aside. You don't need it. All right? It's going to bring you low anyway. You might as well get down on your knees willingly rather than unwillingly. For the Bible says this in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You're going to bow one day or the other. You might as well do it willingly as a saved Christian rather than unwillingly as a lost child of pride. All right, let's pray. Father God, Lord.